Check, check. There we go. Good morning. Good to see you. I just realized here I had a technical difficulty, so I'm getting my lesson up. If you will just allow me to take just a moment. Technology is wonderful when it works here. There we go. Okay, Joshua chapter 4. Uh, we're going to continue on in a series that I began uh, called Memorial Stones. And what we're looking at is just the history of our fellowship. And uh, we began, I told the, the story of my parents' conversion and uh, ministry. And then we're, we started last week looking at... Uh, uh, from the time my parents came in 1970. And so now we're into the Jesus movement. We are looking at this because it is only if you connect to the past and you uh, know where we came from, that is how you can tell whether we're on track for the future. And that is why this is not just a trip down memory lane. We are looking, we're learning lessons. There are things that we do. More importantly, there are things that we are. They come from some place. We can get them from a book. And uh, the history of our church, of course, as we're looking at now, is very uh, closely intertwined with the Jesus movement, which is where we started uh, looking at last week. We're going to continue. Let's get our uh, main scripture, Joshua chapter 4. Four through seven. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God in the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel. <clears throat> okay, so we're beginning, we're looking at the early days. We uh, looked last week at uh, the first uh, hippies that originally got saved Ron and Susie Burrow were actually the first ones who came into uh, the church. Ron had just gotten saved. Dad welcomed them. They became part of the church. And so um, he and then some others that he began to bring began to tell my father that music would really draw young people. We began to explain how much young people were interested in music and they began to tell dad if we were to hold a concert uh, I bet that we could get young people there and then we could uh, preach to them so <clears throat> we had several problems with the the idea of a concert number one we didn't have a band there was no way to have a concert uh, Ron Burrow had gotten saved and he knew uh, a couple of guys so he said that he would be able to put something together. He had been saved in a, in a local band called Eden that was very popular but the, the rest of the members had not been saved yet so he thought that he could put something together. Problem number two, the church had no equipment at all and uh, so they asked around, there was a a lady in town that would be willing to uh, rent a PA system for $35, but the church did not have $35. <laughs> you have to imagine 1970 when dad took over the church, it was in debt, a phone bill that he inherited for $350, which was astronomical money. So now they wanted to do a concert but we didn't have the money, so uh, what happened is that my parents raided their meager savings and scraped together the $35 to rent a PA system so that we could have a concert. We did the very first concert in the boys' club. So here's a lesson that we learned, and this has been foundational. We're going to look at in 
uh, one foundation concerning money next week has to do with investing in what you believe in. The gospel is free. It costs nothing to get saved, but propagating or spreading the gospel, that takes money. And so my parents put together the $35 to be able to have a concert in the boys club. The boys club no longer exists. The building, that's where the, the county building is on uh, Gurley Street. And so at this simple advertising, advertising in those days was hand drawn by my sister and you ran it off on a mimeograph machine if any of you ever uh, remember what that was like. This was not high tech. But at the first concert, we had over 100 visitors. I actually have some pictures from uh, the, the concert here. I think you'll find this is Donna Cluck's uh, cousins there, uh, perhaps in the front, if I remember correctly. And this is not the very first one. This, I think, is probably the second concert at the Boys Club. But you imagine, remember when my parents came with our family of seven, we had 29 people in church. So to have 100 visitors, that was, that was world shaking. Uh, remember the story I told last week about Ron Burl after he left the band and went to Eden who continued. They were playing at Thumb Butte and a, and a man threatened to uh, cut him, came at him with a broken bottle and somebody knocked him out. The word of that spread and at the concert, about 50 young people came just because they began to hear what God did for Ron Burrell and that he uh, uh, had gotten saved. At the concert, they didn't have, Ron threw together a band, but they didn't have enough songs. They didn't have enough to carry the night. So they actually had a guy play that night that wasn't even saved. He was a guy from, Dad, I remember he, all, all my life, he would occasionally talk about this. And that guy from Prescott College, he played in his buckskin jacket and he sang peace songs or something and, uh, on an acoustic guitar. But at that concert, an altar call was pulled and over 40 people got saved. So uh, one of those that I know, Kathy Garfield, if you remember, she's now passed away. Uh, Kathy Garfield was saved that night. Just out of curiosity, is there anybody else you were saved? Anybody here was saved that night? Uh, I don't know. So this was an incredible, you have to imagine from my father's perspective, what he has wanted, his whole salvation and ministry is people to get saved. And now in one night had more than 40 people saved. We had, uh, in early days, I, I had told you, and, and I'll tell more stories later, later lessons, we had a revival with a man named John Metzler. Another man that my dad uh, somehow had connection with was a man named Bob French. I'll put up a flyer here. This is not the actual revival flyer. You see how high tech this flyer was. Now we were to printing stage. By, uh, this was actually one of the early conference flyers, but that was Bob French. Bob French came and uh, the revival was very good. But one of the things that happened is that Bob French began to tell my dad, dad was so excited, you won't believe, look at these hippies that are coming in, these young people that are getting saved. My dad was thrilled. He told everybody he knew because he assumed they would love it too. Bob French told him, you should go to California. And he began to say, look, God is doing something in California. There are hundreds of young people, maybe even thousands of young people that are getting saved. He began to tell him. Their, he, Dad told him about the concert, and he said, that's what they're doing in California. I began to tell him they have this thing called a coffee house. And a coffee house was basically a concert ministry designed to draw young people and so after uh, the uh, revival ended, dad arranged to go to California. He drove over with uh, Ron Burrell and a man named Ron Jones and they drove to California. They went first of all 
to Huntington Beach because Bob French had uh, met a man named Larry Reed. Larry Reed uh, got out of San Quentin prison, got powerfully saved. And uh, he said, uh, Bob French said, he preaches at Huntington Beach right on the beach. When they arrived at Huntington Beach, they came down and sure enough, Bob, uh, uh, Larry Reed was now baptizing people. He would baptize one person and then he had a booming voice. He was preaching boldly. And this thrilled my dad. This is publicly right on the beach telling people about Jesus. So they went to, and uh, introduced themselves and dad invited Larry Reed to come to uh, Prescott and to preach. The next place they went after Huntington Beach, they went to La Habra, California. In La Habra, California, there was a, a coffee house, a man named uh, Don Madison. He had what they called a coffee house. Uh, I don't know how much coffee was actually served. That wasn't the point of it. It was a precursor to the concert ministry. They came in. Young people were sitting on the floor. They were playing music that young people would like and pulling altar calls and people uh, uh, got saved. And so this is what dad wanted. I told you that his frustrations from my parents being raw converts, they were sinners. Mom and dad only ever went to church twice their whole life. They got saved and what dad wanted to see was people saved like him pastoring churches where it was just nice church people and raising kids in a safe environment, having a church club that, did, that held no appeal to dad. But now he's looking at young people, raw sinners, clearly they're, they're messed up, answering altar calls and getting saved. And dad said, that is what I want. He left that, dad told me, and... Uh, uh, for repeatedly through the years, he said when they walked out, he told those men, this will work in Prescott. That con we, we can do that in Prescott. Uh, Ron Burrow added, he said that my dad uh, made the comment if Jesus was alive today, he'd be playing a guitar playing, and uh, getting young people to come and to preach. So that was in La Habra, uh, California. They introduced themselves to this man, Don Madison, uh, who was a pastor who was running this concert ministry called The Vine. And again, they invited him. He had bands. Bring one of your bands. Come to Prescott and preach. Third place they went on a Sunday morning. They went to Costa Mesa, California. And in uh, Costa Mesa, uh, they saw Chuck Smith. I, I told you Chuck Smith was... Uh, actually the pastor in our church in Prescott here in the late 1950s maybe, uh, was only here for one year. But in California, very similar, if any of you have seen the movie uh, Jesus Revolution, uh, I, I commend Chuck Smith. He welcomed hippies, young people, had a heart to see people saved and uh, sparked spark this great move. So they went on a Sunday morning. They saw the band Love Song. They were playing that morning in a morning service and uh, heard him preach. And so that was their trip to California. So off the back of that, they had invited Larry Reed and they invited Larry Reed to come preach a revival and dad was uh, talking about music, he was very excited and, and he thought that Larry was gonna bring an entire band. So he arranged a revival with Larry Reed. So I got a, a photo here and I want you to see this was the original flyer. I want you to see the bottom left hand corner come and groove to the ultimate eternal trip. <laughs> uh, Stephen, add that to the flyer. That's now our new tagline. <laughs> So this is the 70s, that, that was uh, absolutely uh, up to date at that moment in time. So Larry Reed came, preacher revival, 
Dad thought he was bringing an entire band. He actually showed up with two ladies. They were ex-heroin addicts that had gotten saved, and they played guitar and uh, sang. The revival was fantastic, but one of the marking points of our church is that Larry Reed took the people of the church to the courthouse plaza for the first time, and we held a street meeting. We actually have a picture of the very first street meeting in Prescott, Arizona. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? So singing and preaching, and then Larry Reed, he loved Jericho marches. What is a Jericho march? He did it in church. We had a Jericho... Now everybody got up, we sang, and you marched all around the building, marched around the entire plaza and stopped underneath the jail that used to be there, underneath the jail window, and preached boldly Jesus Christ. And so this was actually the very first street meeting that we ever held in uh, uh, Prescott, Arizona. So here's a lesson. This became foundational to who we are is the lesson is the gospel must be taken outside the four walls. That was what dad saw on Huntington Beach at the concert to ministry, The Vine. You, you have to understand, you, you got to think of the paradigm shift in my dad's mind. He had been taught in Bible school what do you do? You have programs for the kiddies. You are waiting for the sinners to come to you. And my dad, he had already began to see that that didn't work. But now this became foundational. We should not be waiting for sinners to come to us. We need to go to them. And it is meeting people where they are at that is what is going to get people saved. This is a biblical foundation, Luke 19.10. Let's read that out. Over here, microphone. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Okay, so this is Jesus. He's explaining his ministry. The ministry of Jesus Christ is what we should copy. And so why is he saying this? They're complaining to the disciples. Uh, your, your teacher, he, he hangs out with sinners. And Jesus says the Son of Man came to not wait in church for them to come, to seek and to save. That is the ministry of Jesus Christ. Luke 14, 23. Next microphone. The master said to the servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and urge the people there to come to, to come so my house will be full. Okay, this is a parable. The parables are teachings of the heart of God. This is how it should operate, is waiting for the people to come to the wedding feast. They're not. He said, then go get them. That is our call. That is absolutely foundational to who we are. You want to understand what is different about the potter's house than most churches in our city is very simple. How often do you see any other churches on the streets? But that is who we are. We do that on regular outreaches. We go door to door. We go to the park plaza. Uh, last night, Matt said they had seven visitors at the concert scene. And again, those were people that received a flyer. They were witness to, and then they came out. So this is uh, who we are. In that revival with Larry Reed, now it began to grow uh, in, in the revivals with John Metzler, Larry Reed. Now everyone getting saved, a mark of salvation is witnessing and people came. In a moment, I'm going to show you a video. I want you to keep in mind the building on Lincoln Street held 65 people. That was what was supposed to be in there. But now, primarily young people begin to flood into our church. We have a video of an early service. The first part is slowed down. I slowed it down and really try to identify people. This is an actual church service. 
Some of you that have been around forever, you'll recognize names of people as you see here, uh, as they're uh, here. This was supposed to be 65 people. Uh, by then we were running well over 100. We would jam 130, 150 into this tiny little building. And you see young people primarily, that is who was coming. People were getting saved, and this is what God was doing here. And uh, this probably was uh, 1971, I would say early 71 maybe, around this time. And then we'll go in a minute when it goes back, then it'll speed up and you'll see the other side now. Here's what it actually looked like. Young people excited. My dad had a great fashion taste, but Larry Reed. <laughs> Right there, that was Larry Reed. This was a Larry Reed revival. Oh, that God would do this again. And would give us a wave of young people. Sharon Allen on the organ. God was doing so much. Thank God. And the young people, because we quickly overwhelmed the seats, you saw they had to fill the altar space. When Sharon got up to play the organ, she could not leave. It was not possible to get back to a seat. She had to sit there through the entire service because God began to move and this was a supernatural work of God. Okay, now a lesson, I, I mentioned it last week, I want to emphasize this. The lesson I want to uh, emphasize, imagine now young people are coming in, hippies, many of them, they were a mess, they smelled, they had problems, they didn't wear shoes, all kinds of different issues. The lesson is on receiving and welcoming those that God brings. When my parents took over the church, the church, as I said, there were 22 besides our family in the first service, very nice, straight, and, and a lot of uh, uh, older people. But what was incredible, remember I told you last week, in the Jesus movement, a genuine revival the Jesus movement was a national revival. I, I said a revival is not an advertised meeting. It is not simply people came and worship. It is when God is drawing people supernaturally all across America and then even in other places. I was talking to Dave Marks. He said when the Jesus movement hit in America, it also uh, was in Canada. God began to bring young people, not just to our church, every kind of church, of every flavor. There was a, a, a stirring that is only of the Holy Spirit. They came. Dave Mark said in his church, he was excited. He began to witness on the streets. Hippies are coming in, and the church rejected them. We do not want people like that. One of the remarkable things is that in our church, these nice, straight, older people welcomed sinners. I want to put up a picture. Here are three of the saints that were originally in. From the right, Maria Garcia. She was already in the church when dad came. Mildred Ools was the piano player in the church. On the far left, Marcella Burgess. Marcella Burgess was born in 1898. Do you understand this? 1898, hippies came in and these ladies welcomed them. Harold Warner lived with Marcella Burgess. This, I want you to understand, this is an incredible thing that God was doing. If God gives us a wave of revival again, the question is, some of you are no longer young hippies. You, that's you. <laughs> right? <laughs> I know, some of you feel like you were born in 1898. We were able to hold on to what God did because of people who had hearts like them. My parents welcomed sinners. That, that was the comment. Ron Burrow was, was shocked. He uh, began to write to uh, his cousins, 
uh, cousin Patty Harris and Jack Harris were living in Idaho, and he said, there is a pastor that loves hippies. And the people in the church love hippies. Next picture that we have here, a young girl, uh, I told you last week, Janet Payson, now she's Janet Foley, Emily, uh, 15 years old. When they got saved, I told you last week, they came on a Sunday night because of Jack Harris' uh, uh, testimony and got saved. Janet is, is young. She's already involved in sin. When she comes to the altar, she said, uh, an uh, older lady um, uh, named Mrs. Gray prayed with her at the altar, was very kind to her, and uh, just began to speak to her about what Jesus had done in her heart. And, and she said, she kept saying to Janet, God gave you something that the world can't give and the world can't take it away. Janet thought that was a scripture in the Bible. She was going to go find that. <laughs> but, but my point is, people welcomed those that were nothing like them. They didn't look like them. They didn't think like them. They probably didn't vote like them. None of that mattered because they had hearts. You see, I, I told you in an earlier lesson, a church is not just what the pastor does. The church is the people. We do this together. It doesn't matter if the pastors are doing the best they can, if God's people don't receive and welcome those that God brings, then we can't. Hold on to it. Early days, a, a famous story from the early days. We had a man that he brought his dog to church. Um, he probably did this hoping to get turned away, uh, but no one bothered him about his dog. Please don't go to the dog pound and start bringing all. The... <laughs> but my point is, no one hassled him. Not only did no one hassle him, his dog peed on the carpet and he tried to clean it up using bleach. So, this, uh, revival is messy. <laughs> That's the point. I'm not just talking about urine. I'm talking about people. <laughs> revival is messy, but no one attacked people over their hair, right? What they look like. They welcomed them so that Jesus could change them. So, here, here's my point. Revival... When God brings in a wave of people, and, and let's face facts, historically, revival is primarily young people. Revival is more of an adjustment for older people than it is for young, right? Young people are flexible. If things change, like, yeah, cool. For older people, you get like, you want to you have dinner at 4.45 and not a minute later, right? <laughs> so the, the question is, for any of you that are no longer teenagers, can you adjust? Can you flex? Can you welcome those that, that God brought in? Harold Warner uh, came. There was a concert at the Armory. And uh, Joe Lou Ballard invited Harold to uh, come to church. He came on a Sunday night. Uh, he came wearing his red corduroy bell-bottom pants and got saved. He, he had just gotten out of uh, uh, the hospital, spent seven days in the hospital, had uh, hepatitis from uh, intravenous drug use, and comes to church and gets saved. The night that he got saved, there was a baptism, a natural part, he quickly understands that you, you get saved, you need to get baptized, and so he wanted to get baptized, and, uh, but they, they had spare clothes they used to let people get wet in, and we didn't have enough, and so Harold kindly offered to get baptized naked. Uh, if that would, uh, you know, <laughs> he wanted to assure me when he told me that story that was, he was not being a pervert, it was just the times. He was just like, you know, if there's no clothes, I want to get baptized, start a new life. And so we didn't let him do that, uh, fortunately. But, but these are, the, so my, my point again, you, you mentioned these are the kind of people that are coming in. The people in church were not like that. Uh, we have then a photo. This is later. This is the trumpet picture, if you want to show the next one. 
Uh, you can't see as big, but this is Scott Flitcroft. When he got saved, uh, Scott got saved. He did a lot of drugs. The, the synapses didn't quite touch anymore and came in looking wild. But again, that was, I think he came in 1975. But my point is God was bringing in people that were nothing like us and they were welcomed so that Jesus could save them. That's a very important lesson. You have to make sure that you let the Holy Spirit change people. And the last time you checked, you are not the Holy Spirit. So that's a lesson for life. Okay, let's, let's look at another lesson here. And that is the outworking of salvation. Okay. In the Jesus movement, late 60s, early 70s, Jesus became cool for a while, right? It was cool to have Jesus in your life. The Doobie Brothers had a song, Jesus is just all right with me. This is a secular band singing about Jesus because, yeah, that's cool. Jesus, he's, he's just all right. Jesus is my friend. That was the refrain of the song. But what that meant for many people was you just added Jesus to your life. Maybe you prayed at one time or you just acknowledge, yes, I like Jesus and that's fine. But you kept living the same way. So something is happening supernaturally in America. As I said, this is not organized. This was not advertising that brought people God brought people supernaturally. They would come into other churches. They would come to our church and they would encounter the gospel of Jesus Christ. And many of them made genuine decisions and they would pray. But what happened in most churches was they added Jesus to their life and then they continued to live the same way whether that was actual sin or whether that was just uh, how you preferred hippies love to wander. So often what would happen? They would encounter Jesus Christ. They many times would genuinely mean it, but then they just keep living their lifestyle. They often would wander, not connected to a church. And so what happened is of the multiplied thousands upon thousands that God was saving all across America, not just in our church, most of that was not retained. They didn't keep it. Okay. Pastor Mitchell, my father, Wayman Mitchell, he doesn't view salvation that way. And he began to preach true conversion is a surrender to God's will. Sin is simply rebellion. God, I don't want your will. Don't tell me how to live. It doesn't matter if your flavor of sin is drugs, alcohol, pornography, immorality. It doesn't matter the flavor. All sin is rebellion. God, don't tell me how to live. I don't want your will. Someone who has a genuine conversion experience is not just saying, yes, I agree, or yes, I will pray, or yes, I like Jesus. True conversion is a surrender to God's will. Acts 9, verse 6. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Okay, this is Saul who becomes the Apostle Paul. This is one of the most incredible conversions in history. And when he encounters Jesus Christ, his response was not, Jesus is just all right, oh yeah. His response was, Lord, what would you have me to do? That is real conversion. And this is what Pastor Mitchell began to preach. He did not hassle people the moment they get in about their voting preferences, about their hair length, their clothing styles. He didn't do that. What he preached is 
conversion is surrender to God's will. If you're really saved, you need to do the will of God. So he began to preach and challenge hippies for stability. Many times it was common. They, we had people that came here because they were hitchhiking. They were wandering through. They get saved. Their intention was, great, I'm saved and I'll keep wandering. But he began to preach stability. You need to do the will of God. Harold Warner told me yesterday, he said that uh, after he had been saved a, a short amount of time, uh, some circumstances, he began to think began to ask out loud, does it, he was from the East Coast, he's from Massachusetts. So he began to ask, does anybody know of a church in Massachusetts or on the East Coast that I could go to? Because I have family there, I could do a lot of good there, so God saved me here, but now I'll wander and tell people in another place. Pastor Pitcher began to preach and he began to say, the will of God has an address. This was a foundational teaching that he preached from the early days. The will of God is not wherever you want to do the will of God. The will of God has an address for you. This is found in many places. One of these is 1 Kings 17, verse 8 and 9. Okay, you'll find two times in, uh, uh, in these verses here the word there. Go to a specific place, Zarephath. This is inside it. And live there. And I've commanded a widow there to take care of you. So in other words, if Elijah said, you know, God, I'm not really into the Zarephath thing. I'm more of a rolling stone, you know. I just want to want. He would not be in God's will. You want to have a relationship with God, the will of God has an address. You, you can't. If you're saying, I, I, just, I just want to, for weather, for family, for job, for whatever, I'll just live wherever I want to, that, that doesn't line up with true relationship with God. So Pastor Mitchell began to challenge. So this is fundamental. This is why there, there have been books written, many books written about the Jesus movement, remarking, as I said, young people getting saved was not unique to us. It happened in Baptist churches, Lutheran, all kinds of churches, young people came, but most of those it was simply a blip in their history and eventually it all faded away. That is not what happened in our church. Our church retained the fruit that God gave and actually we are one, I think I read in one book, they identify four movements that were started out of the Jesus movement. And I can't remember the other two, but us and Calvary Chapel are movements retained what God gave and carried on and, and foundational was the will of God has an address. You gotta find, where does God want you to be? When people come and they say, I'm thinking of moving, I'm thinking of roaming, what is it? but I'm not God. Have you asked God? What does God want you to do? Because the will of God has uh, an address. Any place that is not preached, you don't retain. Bruce Cutter told me there, uh, he was from uh, Beverly, Massachusetts, and he said in his hometown, I can't remember if it was Beverly or Wenham in Massachusetts, there was a man there, he had a youth group that had 200 young people. <laughs> that is a church. And he just said, uh, you know, just find a church that doesn't exist today. It didn't carry on, but when you're preaching, conversion is surrender to God's will, and part of that is the will of God has an address, you retain it. And so anytime you have people surrendering to the will of God, 
Remember Elijah, Elijah, when God said, go to Zarephath, it is because God wanted to use him. The point of salvation is not just you getting to heaven. The point of salvation is what does God want to do in you, that's change, and through you, that's impact, that's ministry, that only comes through surrender. One of the things that is incredible, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'll uh, make reference today, it actually happened the following year, I think in 1971, uh, Michelle Greeley came from this place in Beverly and Wenham in, in Massachusetts, came to Prescott College, and uh, in the library, a young teenager named Mike Maston that got saved uh, in, the, in the high school in this initial wave witnessed to Michelle Greeley. Michelle immediately began to write letters home to everybody she knew, you need to get saved. You will know uh, today, Michelle Greeley is Michelle Olson. We're going to play a video. This just shows what happens when people surrender to the will of God. Bruce Cutter put this together, and this is a, a reference of what God did. These are the, the little, or Hamilton. I've, I've been calling it Beverly. I'm sorry. Population 10,000 people in 1970. Michelle gets saved and began to witness to people, and they began to come out to Prescott, Arizona from Massachusetts because of Michelle. That's Michelle. Now she's Michelle, Michelle Olson. Bruce Cutter came. That's Sally Billadu Olson, Pam Drago Race, Mark Olson, Mark Hurley, Bill Coolidge, Kevin Foley, Steve Welch, Peter Olson, Rick Flynn, Steve Domratsky. All of those were just from, they were all connected. They began to get saved, tell their friends. They began, and then there are other uh, people they didn't have pictures of that are on the screen. And that is just from the, uh, the two communities, and then from one town away in Beverly and Ipswich. Then there came some more names you might recognize, Don McPherson, Dave Baraclow, Jane Ann, on, on and on and on. Okay, isn't that wonderful? Thank God. So this is what God begins to do. When God genuinely saves, think about this. The mark of conversion is you have a hunger for the will of God. That is crucial. You cannot build a church if people are not genuinely converted. You, if you're just collecting people, sometimes I see guys, they're trying to pioneer, they're trying to build churches. They have a collection of people, but none of them have a hunger for God's will. So that means they're actually still living as rebels against God. I don't mind coming to church. That is not genuine conversion. In genuine conversion, people want to do the will of God. What does that mean? That means they want to change. They, they want to... Uh, they want to uh, do God's will in, in many different ways. One of the things here that, that uh, was remarkable, uh, not only in, in they, they, they have a hunger for God's will, God begins to change, and it comes from God. Pastor Mitchell began to preach. Uh, we're going to go back to a photo, guys, on the, uh, my media guys. One of the things that happened with early hippies is one, they wanted to wander. Some of them chose to stay. Pastor Mitchell said, the bib there's a reason so many pictures in the Bible of godly things are agricultural. Plants have roots. And Pastor Mitchell began to preach, put down roots in the will of God. Where God planted you, put down roots so that you can grow and you can change. So some of them, that meant staying. Others, this meant working. Hippies weren't big on work. Right? It was cool to wander and let other people give you a place to crash or give you some money or you know, some food to eat. So Pastor Mitchell began to preach to hippies a four-letter word. It's called work. God, he began to preach, God is a worker. If you're saved, you need to work. 
and you need to work a job. So my father did not hassle people when they came in about the length of their hair, but hippies began applying. And you gotta imagine, Prescott was 13,000 people. It was a cowboy town. We, we have stories in early days of uh, uh, late 60s, early 70s of cowboys that would catch hippies and with their pocket knife would give them a haircut. That was the kind of community. So now these hippies say, I want to stay here. And they're applying to redneck business owners. I would like a job. And they began to discover my hair is hurting my job chances. Dad often would say through the years, one of the early guys, he went and applied for a job and he tucked, he put on a hat, and <laughs> tucked his hair up in there. He was going to fool him and, and uh, get a job. So as a result of what God was doing, some of them began to say, I'm going to get a haircut. And that was revolutionary. When they began to decide to, to do that, Harold Warner when he got saved with his long hair and his red corduroy, corduroy bell bottoms, he decided he wanted to get a job. Uh, he said he tried a, a logging job that lasted two weeks. Another one, I can't remember. The, I think he worked in the library at Prescott College for a short amount of time. And then he applied at the Food Queen supermarket, and the person interviewing him was a man named Charlie Foster. And Charlie Foster explained to him that he had fired the last three young guys for taking drugs. And Harold said, no problem. I, Jesus changed me. I don't take drugs anymore. And so Harold got a job. We got a picture. This is actually from the newspaper. Is This is Harold in his meat market whites at uh, working at the Food Queen supermarket. Harold began to witness to Charlie and Marsha Foster. And he said, I wasn't afraid of Charlie, but Marsha scared me. <laughs> Harold witnessed to everything that moved. He got in trouble as people would place a meat order. He would wrap their meat and stick gospel tracks in there, which many people did not appreciate. But on breaks and on lunch, he began to witness Two young men that lived across the street from the Food Queen supermarket, they lived next door to Greg Malinowski, is uh, Gary Guptill and Roger Fisher. And Harold Warner began to witness to them when they would come in to the supermarket and then began to catch them outside of that. Gary Guptill is here this morning because he got saved. Harold Warner, the hippie, worked a job not only did, was he saved and going to heaven, but because he connected himself to God's will, God began to use his life. That is true for you, and that's, that's universal. I want you to understand, the will of God is foundational to who we are as a church. You hear preaching, this is now 53 years later, you will hear myself or Pastor Jesse or Pastor Stephen, or Pastor Hart, you will hear us preach about the will of God when you come to our conferences again and again because we believe if God is going to use our lives, it starts with, Lord, what do you want me to do? And if you make up your mind to do the will of God, not only does God use you personally, like Harold Warner witnessing to Gary Guptill, Roger Fisher, different ones that he won to the Lord, and because of his witness later on, Charlie and Marcia were saved uh, uh, as a result of that. He can use your life personally, but then if you connect yourself to God's will in a local church, you become a part of everything the church becomes. We now have from our church, we began, and that's later lessons, planting churches. We now have 3,300 churches around the world because people said, I want to do the will of God. Lord, what would you have me to do? If you want me to be in a place, I'm going to be in a place. You want to be in a ministry, I'll be in a ministry. You want me to pray, you want me to give. That is foundational to who we are 
That is not, if, if you're a church shopper, if you're looking and you're going to compare our worship style to the guy down the street or what is our children's ministry, do we offer helicopter rides on Easter or what do you, you're probably not going to like it here because that's not who we are. You need to hear from God, what does God want you to do? And once you make up your mind, I want to be a part of God's will, God can use you to make impact. And so these are foundation stones, literally, that we line up with if we ever move away from the will of God. If we ever come to a point where now serving God is whatever you want to do, we will die. And the only thing that keeps us on track is we continually line up with we're not going to change. Our music has changed. It's not the same as it was in 1970. It may evolve you know, over time. That's fine. But the foundation stones of God's will, conversion, welcoming sinners, that will never change. But that's a choice. I can't make that choice for you. That's what I'm going to do. Amen. But you've got to decide that for yourself because what I am praying for is that God would give us a national revival again. That is my prayer. God, bring in as a wave and let us be. I can't predict how other churches will react if God gives a wave of revival again. We can only decide what we're going to do. How many of you say amen to that? Amen. Thank God. God bless you. We'll stop there. The service will start at 1030.